I have some people freak out about me stabbing my hand, uh, which fairly I've done a handful of times, no pun intended. Um, a couple years ago, I put a half inch chisel all the way down to the bone through here, but that was not uh, anyone's mistake except for mine and how I was holding something in the vise. Not hand carving like this. Uh, basically, the clamp gave away that I was holding onto and slipped. Um, but if you ever see me carving like this, you'll see me do two things. One, the amount of the chisel that's sticking out when I hit my palm is hitting this and that keeps everything from going into my hand. If I was up here carving, that would be very dangerous. So carving very controlled, taking lots of little slice, little bitty bits. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm establishing a flat ground on this transition. I'm gonna do that on both sides and then I get to check to see if the volutes are even right because you don't want one higher than the other or them being crooked or anything like that um, so i'll profile all of these and then start kind of carving in my final depth at an angle because that will make this appear to rise up higher so uh one of the first times i ever carved one of these i got really discouraged because i carved it really really well i thought all the way up and then when i slowly started adding this slope I had to re-carve everything down because it was sticking out so far. So what I do now, you'll see me do, is I will get the final level profile of the kind of ramp around and then adjust the height and the symmetry and all those things. So I'll work for just a little bit, um, but there's no sense in just watching this for a very long time. I'll get this stuff done and catch up with you guys in a little bit. All right, round one is done. So I've gotten this level all the way up and my sides are looking symmetrical. But what I need to do now is actually start angling in the edges. These, these faces are not totally flat, they angle in. So as I angle in, it's gonna make this look longer, which means it is longer. So I have to actually angle that in all the way up, find my actual end levels, cut off what we call the, uh, the buttons or the edges here to get into the right width, and then I can start doing the kind of final shaping of the exterior of the scroll. I'm using a small spacer to trace out the rib structure onto our top piece of spruce. This allows for the distance of overhang and the ability to fine tune the edge without colliding with the ribs. All right, so we've got our profile lined out here and I'm just gonna cut it on the bandsaw, but I want you guys to appreciate this spruce. Here is all three boards put together and you would be amazed at the growth rings, how tight all of this is across the whole width. Nuts, really, really beautiful stuff. Um, I do have one concern, we're gonna see how this hits. You can see it right here, where someone put a screw or a nail, um, or a, looks like a nail, um, and I put it near the edge intentionally because it's not gonna be in the final instrument. It'll be shaped out, right? So it'll be cut off that surface because this is gonna get milled down low. But when I milled the back, there's also one right here that doesn't show anywhere else. So it didn't come from the edge, it didn't come from this edge, it didn't come from this edge. So I'm assuming um, that maybe someone put a hole in it years and years ago, but it should have healed over. 
So I don't know what that entails, but we're gonna shape a lot of that, and so it should go away anyways. Uh, but anyhow, so what we're gonna do first, we're gonna mill out our, or not mill out, but cut out our basic profile, and then we're gonna do a little mill work on the edge to reduce the edge before we start profiling the outside of our top. to focus in on the smoothness of these transitions and curves. These curves and outer edges will serve as a reference when you cut the purfling into the top of the violin. Now soon we'll also be working on the back, coming up in a second, but first I do a lot of this by hand with files and rasps and sandpaper, um, checking often with my hands more than my eyes to feel symmetry or any lumps or anything sticking out of the ordinary uh, that would reflect later as a reference mark when we cut purfling or anything else. All right, so this is the block for our back. And this back is twisted a little bit and cut a bit. So. Before I can put this through a planer, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually use a power planer to take off the majority of the meat of this uh, for our back. I might be able to resaw it, but I don't want to risk it for what we're doing. So the first step is I got to get this flat on the bottom of our back to run through a machine. I'd like to save the grain on the top, which is the underside currently. Um, so that's why I'm taking off the material off this back. So it rocks. It has two high points here. I have a set of what are called winding sticks. And these sticks are dead flat. They have a little silver pin in the middle of them. And these little black bars made out of walnut on the sides. And what these do is you can find the wind in a board. So I can put this at the bottom and at the top. I line up my two pins and I sight down this line. And these walnut pieces are for contrast because you will actually see them peeking out one way or the other. And that tells us what side is too high or low to make it flat and level. So it just extends the warp in the board for you to see it really, really easily. So I'll be using these, and then I'll be using a scrub plane. A scrub plane, um, they actually can make a scrub plane, but I make my own. This is an old number three uh, with a very, very sharply cambered iron in it that I made. And so this will actually take a scoop out instead of a flat shaving. It's much more aggressive, but it's made just to remove a lot of material quickly. So I'll use uh, my scrub plane here to get the high points down until I have a flat back that I can then mill the top flat. Or at least figure out how much material we need to lose. So let's go and do that. So that's taking the wind out, but I still have the cup in there. <clears throat> and so I'll flatten this back out a little bit more and then run it through a surface planer uh, to get it dead flat. Well, maybe I'll do it by hand. We'll see. This ash is fantastic to work with. 
Uh, so far, it's been amazing. So, we'll see how this runs. Um, I'll put my number six on it and see how she flattens out. So what I'm doing here is I'm using my plane as a sight line. The edge of this, you can see the light under it in the middle. I'll keep working the sides, regularly checking this until those sides slowly start to meld in the middle. So I have a longer way to go down here because the board is wider. So I put more effort on these sides. So, I've got the back flattened out. I was able to resaw off a piece so I could save a little thin piece, maybe to make a jewelry box out of uh, for someone else. Connie, maybe. Don't know. Um, anyhow, I got a little piece of that mountain ash off that I could save, and then this is going to be the back. Now, here's where I struggle I'm indecisive because I get excited about creativity and all the possibilities, and I question myself a lot. Um, this is going to be absolutely beautiful, but what I have to determine is the orientation. There's a certain amount of grain that predicts the order, but I also have this little template that I love to use. That is a frosted piece of plexi. Now you can see what the back of the violin is going to look like. Now here's where I get stuck. Do I want it to face like that or have that cathedral grain going up? I was so stuck on the other way around and now I don't know. There's gonna be some inlay on the back bottom. So if I have it here, that may be a very good quality to have it there, uh, to have it run up. This piece of spalting will 90% go away. Um, but what I oftentimes think about is what is it gonna look more like? Because as I remove this stuff, it's gonna start looking more like the back, okay? Uh, so I gotta figure it out what I'm gonna do here. It helps me to verbally process, so thank you for listening. So, if I have that guy with an inlaid piece down here, I think that'll work well, and I like that cathedral running up. If I have it the other way around, I like the shape going down, and it's gonna get smaller, that shape is gonna get smaller. Yeah, I don't know. All right, I'll figure it out, and you'll see it being cut. All right, I figured out what I'm going to do for the uh, top back, consulted with my amazing artist wife, and um, she had a good idea. So, uh, as always. So, I'm going to actually tilt this to line it up with the grain of this and have it kind of be a little more symmetrical. Um, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to mark the top and the bottom, not for the shape, because I actually need to get that shape on the other side. So, what I'm going to do now is I lose that. I'm going to run a line across the center where everything's going to be because it's not right in the board. It would be like this. I can then run those lines down the board on the side. And over the other edge. So now, I've transferred that line from the back, or the top, to the underside. And this is now where I'm going to line up the back piece here. So we have our ribs all done up, I have my top, 
this, the back is going to be sitting inside there on a center line that we already have determined. So now I need to measure up and down. So from my original mark, which of course I didn't leave, I got it right there. Okay. I can measure up this distance. And that's the outside edge of my instrument. So now I get to line this up and trace it out. So now I know exactly kind of what that grain is going to do and where it's going to sit. I'm going to move it up just a hair. Now here is where I always mess myself up. So, quick story. My, uh, my sister moved to Atlanta when we were living in Florida um, years and years ago. And the first time I went to her house, I took a wrong turn. And every single time after going on that wrong turn, every time I went to visit her, I would take that turn and say, ah, oh, this feels right because it was familiar and wrong. And I messed it up every time she lived there, or every time I went to visit her. And so, same case with this. The first time I ever made one of these instruments, I cut the button off the top, and I uh, had to splice one in. And ever since then, it is a real challenge not to cut the button off, because it feels familiar and right and easy. So I constantly have to not do that. So I always have to leave a gap. So that's our center line. That's our outside edge. We are pretty much good to go. Let's cut this out. some reference holes in the top and back of the violin and so what I'm looking at right here are these little dots and what I'll do is actually drill them in until there's a certain depth of thickness left in the material so at this point I want 17 millimeters this one's 16.5 14.5 13.5 etc left so I'll drill to remove the waste leaving a certain amount so that when I carve this as soon as I hit those dots I know that I need to stop, I'm done. That gives me the curve this way uh, of the arching, okay? So this is for the front arching, and I have the same thing for our back. Now if you notice what I've done here is a lot of traditional luthiers will score the side, leaving the thickness of their plates right here. This is four and a half, this is five millimeters, but it'll get down to about four, four and a half. Um, and then they'll start carving, they'll start splitting that wood up. You'll see them oftentimes do this with a gouge or a chisel or a plane this way. Uh, I did that on my first few. I found that what I really enjoy is I will take a router and route out, right, with a template bit, like a uh, just a rabbiting bit. I'll cut out that material. And so I know I have a very flat, clean edge that I can start sculpting to. Now, that being said, I'm a sculptor first, artist first, instrument maker second. Um, so with that in mind, I like to use sculptural tools more often than certain luthier tools. So you will see me use some unique tools in here. Um, I have made them very traditionally with all of the scraping and cutting and everything else. I love hand planes. We've already established that. But for this arching, I feel really comfortable with a die grinder. And so I actually have a sanding disc and I will sculpt and shape 
all of that. Um, I'll put a picture of here of, or somewhere, some sculpture stuff using that die grinder. Um, it's one of my favorite little tools. So I'll use that to shape all the contours of this plate. Um, yeah, so let's get to drilling and then we can start shaping. Then we can do purfling and then the list goes on forever. Okay, let's start. I made myself years ago these fun little templates for most of my common measurements. And so what I can do is I'll hold this little guy here, crank down my press until it holds the template up, and I put a stop block there. So now I know when I drill down, that's my exact 17 millimeters. There we go, 17 millimeters, okay? So I'll do this and then step them down and do all my holes.